Proceed to record. Recording in progress. To record the meeting. So the agency having received an application for environmental authorization from EEPGL for the proposed project, um, it was screened and placed on the 28 days public notice on June 20. 7, 2021, notifying the public, of course, of the EIA required decision. This, of course, is in keeping with the Environmental Protection Act, Chapter 2005, Laws of Guyana, where an environmental impact assessment is required for certain types of projects be before any decision can be made on whether or not an authorization should be granted. Uh, of course, um, most of you, those persons who were initially a part of previous um, scoping meetings would know that public participation is an integral part of the EIA process. Um, therefore, in the early stages of the, of the process, the agency conducts um, scoping meetings for the proposed project. Hence the reason you are here. Um, you're here to, to learn about the project, um, to say how you think the project will impact you, um, and your your livelihood, and also make recommendations on what should be captured in the terms and scope to be developed to guide the environmental impact assessment study. All right, so just to bring your attention briefly to the agenda for this afternoon, I will share my screen. All right, a bit of um, technical difficulties there, but just to know that um, following this, you will be provided with an overview um, of the project from Mr. Derek, uh, Dr. Derek, um, Eric, sorry, D'Amico of EEPGL. And following his presentation, um, we most of the time will be spent engaging with each other in terms of clarifying any um, questions you may have in relation to the project. Um, the project and the project scope or the EPN is process, but more so contributing, making your contributions um, and those recommendations that will be vital to the development of a comprehensive and a really robust terms and scope for the EIA for this gas, the energy project. All right, so without further um, delay, I will now hand you over to Dr. Eric D'Amico, who will provide you with an overview of the proposed project. Okay, good afternoon. I'm, I'm hoping that all of you are able to see my project description slide uh, as introduced. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction. Welcome everybody on this uh, gas to energy scoping session. And thank you, Ms. Brower. Thompson for the opening and the introduction. As mentioned, my name is Eric D'Amico and I am the EEPGL project environmental and regulatory manager based here in Guyana. In the upcoming slides, uh, my goal is to provide an overview of the gas to energy project. And as you will see, uh, there are details that are still to be determined. It's very early in the project design stages. And this is designed that way to ensure that we do collect the comments and concerns uh, for those that are around for the, the project uh, development. However, uh, I feel that there will be sufficient details for all of you, the stakeholders, to raise those concerns and provide those comments to the EPA. The, the EIA process will evaluate the potential environmental and socioeconomic impacts, uh, proposing some of the strategies to manage and or mitigate those impacts and identify the Benefits. Uh, so with that, I'll go ahead and get started. As many of you have likely heard, the proposed project uh, would bring associated gas from ExxonMobil Guyana operated projects, specifically Liza Phase 1 and Phase 2, also known as Liza Destiny and Liza Unity, to onshore gas processing facilities through a pipeline that would transport up to 15 million standard cubic feet of natural gas to the facilities per day. In the upcoming slides, I'll talk more about the onshore and offshore components. I do wanna highlight in this uh, image 
on the right hand side, as you'll see that the pipeline comes in and enters an area west of the Demerara area, uh, at Demerara River that is, and toward the processing facilities. The project construction and operation, uh, the construction will take approximately 30 months, so a little under uh, three years, and design project for 25 years. So now a little bit on the de details, it's broken into a few different components. First, I call your attention to the offshore pipeline. The pipeline was approximately 220 kilometers long, and it will be through a 12 inch gas export pipeline connecting from the two FPSOs to the onshore portion of the pipeline and the facility. The pipeline will be transported offshore, welded together and lowered onto the seafloor. Notionally, in the shallower waters, the pipelines will be buried underneath the seafloor to protect against damage. As the pipeline approaches the shore, dredging could be potentially utilized to provide access for vessels and the pipeline. Prior to starting up the entire the pipeline, the entire pipe will be pressure tested to ensure pipeline integrity. And that's what's referred to as the hydrostatic test that will be carried out. For the areas that are outside the 100 meter contour lines, and I apologize for those with smaller screens, it might be difficult to see, but the, the blue lines offshore, those are showing contour lines, and in the water depths greater than 100 meters, the pipeline will be laid on the seafloor. The red outline in that picture is identifying the block where the LIZA 1 and LIZA 2 vessels will be. And as you know, the destiny is currently in the waters and unity is coming later online. Moving from onshore, offshore to onshore, the onshore portion of the export pipeline will run from the shore landing location to the NGL plant. The pipeline route was selected by the government of Guyana from various considered options and will largely follow existing roads and canals. To install that part of the pipeline, a number of methods are being studied as part of the design and construction planning. It is anticipated that major canal and roadway crossings will be executed using trenchless or drilling uh, methods where ap appropriate. And the pipeline will be buried approximately 1.2 meters along the route to prevent damage and intrusion. As you see on the fig figure on the right hand side, the pipeline corridor is depicted on the slide where the notional uh, pipeline corridor where we're temporary construction right of way is estimated to be about 23 meters in width. The permanent right of way is preliminarily estimated to be 12 meters. The additional temporary construction right of way provides the ability to move dirt and other excavation materials out of the immediate area and follow through with the construction in a safe and efficient method. Okay. Further on down the line, moving from the onshore portion, uh, pipeline portion to the natural gas liquids plant and I will call to this uh, point right now, it is an artistic representation only in the lower right hand side. Uh, final layout is determined uh, along the long, longer down the road when we get down to the detailed design phase, but it's included here to give you a, a sense of what the plant may look like. It would be located in the southern portion of the Wales estate and will include processing and treating equipment. In support of the NGL plant construction, there will be temporary infrastructure established such as access roads, lay down areas, and a river offloading facility, which I will highlight in the next slide. To support the NGL plant operation phase, permanent roads and structures 
may be established in addition to the plant itself. The, P, the NPA, N, NGL plant will be equipped with an inclu, enclosed ground flare, which will be used during process safety or maintenance of activities. When the gas reaches the plant from the pipeline, it is first heated, then the pressure will be reduced to avoid any liquid dropout in the pipeline or plant. The next, the natural gas will pass through several treatment steps to remove components such as mercury and hydrogen sulfide. Following treatment, the natural gas will then be processed to separate out the natural gas list liquids from the lean gas stream. And the final portion is when the final liquid products are stored on site, sold to a third party for distribution, and the lean gas steam will be sent to a third party developed power plant in the Wales estate for the power generation. As referred to in the previous slide, it is necessary to have a temporary materials offloading facility. This facility uh, will be located on the west bank of the Demerara River for the duration of the construction phase of the project. The facility design will consist of moored shallow draft barges used for offloading project modules and materials. It is anticipated that some dredging may be required to enable the vessel movement in this area to the west bank of the Demerara, and that will be studied further following geotechnical and geophysical surveys that will be undertaken. I hope the previous slides that have shown gives a good overview of the project that has been uh, submitted to the EPA through the project summary and the application. I wanted to highlight here that there are additional scoping meetings that are, are occurring. Uh, we've uh, completed one in region five, two in regions in region six. You're all joining us here today, thankfully, uh, for a virtual meeting. And there's a number of additional ones across uh, the regions uh, that we can uh, expect to be able to receive more comments and concerns on this proposed project. Before I turn it over uh, back to Ms. Uh, Brower Thompson, we did want to just highlight a number of the items that is included as a preliminary list of the resources and receptors, receptors to be considered in the environmental impact assessment. These include the, um, the number of lists here uh, in no specific order of importance, but carries out all of the physical resources, biological resources, and indeed socioeconomic resources that is, will be included as part of a preliminary list where the EPA will identify the terms and scope of the environmental impact assessment. In support of some of the topics on the previous slide, it is important to uh, establish baseline studies. This is not the first time we've carried out a number of these studies, and some of these studies have been ongoing for a number of years as part of the initial EIAs uh, that have been conducted. But these include those you see on the screen that are uh, help identify and document the current physical, biological, and socioeconomic conditions in and around the project area. As this is an onshore project, we obviously have offshore components, but some onshore components that were not necessarily considered on some of the earlier EIAs, which were for offshore projects. The final list of baseline studies required for the EIA will be determined by the EPA through consultations as such as this, and provided through the stakeholders during this 28 day public comment period. And lastly, if uh, there, the environmental impact assessments for EEPGL projects, plus the many, many other various projects uh, that have occurred throughout uh, Guyana are available off the EPA website, but I wanted to give a, an, an idea for everyone here of the content of the EIAs, which includes a project description, which goes into uh, greater detail than uh, what affords us time today to go through, talks about some of the planning framework for the legal and the policy, what 
scope conditions are, or scope of the EIA is, and some of the other key conditions and key information that we have, including baseline impacts and conditions, the cumulative impacts, how EEPGL plans to mitigate any unplanned events or upsets for the facilities, management and monitoring plans, and finally, the technical appendices, which includes the study reports, modeling reports, and any supplementary data that would be required. So uh, with that, I believe I can turn it back over to Ms. Uh, Brower Thompson. Thank you, Eric. And thanks to everyone who um, has joined after the introduction. Um, so just to give you an overview um, of where we are, the, an overview of the project, the proposed gas energy project was presented by um, Eric D'Amico from EEPGL. And we are at the stage in the agenda now where the floor will be open for your submissions. Um, so we want to do that in a very orderly fashion. Um, and we haven't restricted the, the audio, the mics, um, in terms of persons being able to unmute themselves. However, they are persons managing the platform. So I would kindly ask that you, you use the reaction button. Um, at the bottom of your screen, and you can raise your hand if you want to make a submission um, at this time, um, or if you need any, any if you need any specific clarification. Um, but more so, just to reiterate that this is the public scope and meeting for the gas, the energy, the proposed gas the energy project. It's complementary to the public notice, which was published by the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, on the 27th of June. And that notification period provides for a written submission um, to the executive director on matters and questions um, and recommendations which would like to be addressed in the environmental impact assessment study for this project. All right, so I would ask that you raise your hand um, and you, we will indicate when you can unmute. Additionally, you can also use the, the chat feature and you can have your questions placed in the chat or you can have your recommendations play, placed in the chat. Um, just a reminder that this is not, the EIA hasn't been completed as yet, right? So specific questions as it relates to um, outcomes and so on, that will not be um, answered at this forum. forum. Rather, it's for you to make your recommendations for what should be captured in the terms and scope for the EIA for this project. So the floor is now open. I see Vanda's hand is up, so you can unmute and you can proceed, Vanda. Um, just before you go, Vanda, um, because we're recording the submissions, could you indicate on the persons who who are asking questions indicate which organization you're representing, or you know, if you're just a member of the public, that's fine. Um, but just indicate your name. If your name is not um, clearly written on your device, um, what organization you're representing, and then you can proceed to make your submission. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, okay. Um, I'm just here independently. Um, thank you very much as um, citizen of Guyana. So um, thank you for the uh, presentation and the opportunity. Um, first of all, I just wanted to um, uh, basically two questions. Um, uh, one is the um, issue of the, of the wastewater, the produced water um, on the floating oil rig platform. Does that have any uh, bearing? I think it does um, on the general um, environmental and social impact assessment of this project and all others that Exxon is involved in, number one. Number two, is there going to be even more flaring um, carried on by Exxon for this particular gas to shore pipeline? And if so, how much? Thank you. Thank you, 
Um, all right, Vanda, so if I hear you clearly, um, I indicated um, initially because we are in the preliminary stages of developing the terms in school. So you would like to see um, captured in the terms and scope, scope, sorry, whether um, there will be aspects of additional um, flaring that it would be a part of this new project. Um, if yes, I, if um, I get if you, you want, correctly. I can repeat the question. I don't know why it's so complicated. Number one, they speak about um, <laughs> water. Yeah, and I'm not. asking whether, well, since Exxon is uh, produced, is producing a lot of this uh, pretty bad wastewater on a daily basis, uh, there was a picture actually just the other day with this water gushing out into our uh, seas, our ocean, our EZ. And I just want to know if there's going to be any mention generally of this produced water, uh, bad water, wastewater, that is going to be part of its ongoing operations, including gas to shore. I think it should be because it, it, it concerns our waters. Secondly, flaring. Is Exxon Mobile going to be doing flaring connected to the gas to shore pipeline? And if so, how much? Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Vanda. We got those um, very clearly um, for as considerations for the terms and scope. For this project, please remember to have your mics muted if you if you're not um, making a recommendation or or asking a question. Thank you. Are there any other submission before we go to the chat? You have a, another question, Vanda, or is it that your hand is still up? All right, I see Simone. Simone, please go ahead to make your submission. Thank you. Simone Mangal, I think, is that That's correct, correct Candice, thank you. Uh, Mr. D'Amico, thank you very much for your presentation, which was very clear. I, um, I'm representing, uh, I'm just a citizen of Guyana, but I'm also an environmental professional, and I am quite concerned about the future generation, and that's why I'm here. I'm struggling to be able to meet the objectives of this exercise because the scope of this project uh, is not clear in the description that has been published. And you would appreciate as a professional in this field that unless the scope is clear, we cannot begin to imagine what areas of impacts have to be examined. And I would like very much to be able to constructively contribute to the terms of reference process, participatory process that you have. Now, when you presented the project, you said that the purpose was to transport gas. To my mind, that's the means. So the, the, the real question I would like to understand is what is the purpose of transporting gas to the shore of Guyana via a pipeline? Is it to monetize the gas? Is it uh, because uh, Guyana requires an energy demand that is going to be met by this gas? Now, when you presented, I understood two things that wasn't clear in the written description. The first is that the gas would be at an NGL facility on shore, and it's going to be processed, processed into propane, butane, pentane, and liquids for sale. And then the dry gas is pumped to a power station, which the government of Guyana is constructing and will be using. So for me to really contribute to this process, I would like to understand who owns the gas? Who is selling the propane, butane, and pentane? Is it a joint venture? That, that's important. The second thing that's important is what is the power demand that the government of Guyana has or the people of Guyana have to justify a pipeline coming to shore? Because if we, if we have an X amount of demand and a, pro, a projected demand based on business as usual, 
and we have an excess demand coming, it's effectively a, an isolated um, place with, that's getting all this gas um, through a pipeline, which means we're either using it all up or we are intending to put in an industrial footprint to use it up. And we need to comprehend where that is going in order to fully understand what the cumulative impact or the real impact according to the parameters you have outlined which are environmental as well as socioeconomic so i would like to submit that these matters are clarified now they have to be clarified before you can engage a process where we are able to actually give you the kinds of feedback you need on terms of reference All right, thank you very much, Simone. Eric? Uh, uh, thank you uh, for, for the comments and understand some of the questions that uh, have been posed there. Um, as, as part of this process for the EIA, it's very clear that we need to stay within the constraints of what the project specifically ties to, which is the initiating location of of the pipeline, not considering the FPSOs, it's actually the beginning of the pipeline, through the terminus at the natural gas liquid plant. For the information that you're requesting as it, as it relates to associated facilities that may develop as a process uh, and as a follow-up from this project, uh, that's outside of the pro project scope. Uh, and that actually goes into some of the commercial uh, aspects of a project and we are really looking for those uh, environmental the biological the physical receptors and the socioeconomic and I'm sure you'll then say you know how can we look at socioeconomic if I'm not sure of all the other uh, tie-in effects that this project may uh, follow up with and I think that's where uh, the uh, the notes will be taken for the comments and concerns to ensure that the EIA captures that information as it goes through the process. And this is the, the first opportunity to hear more about the project. It's, in, it's very early in, in the stages. Uh, we have uh, stakeholder engagements and a consultation period uh, later uh, in, in, in the cycle to capture more information and hopefully provide you some of those additional details that uh, you, were, you were requesting. I know there, these comments have been uh, captured and uh, we will try to look at providing those uh, at a later time. But as it relates to the commercial uh, aspects of it, I don't have that within my uh, uh, information at this time. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Um, yes, so we are reminded that um, we will keep our discussion within the ambit of the proposed project and of course um, Simone and others if there are other recommendations or considerations that um, you would like the, the agency to take on board um, you can you can also send those submissions your written submissions to the executive director and you have until July 25th to do so so I'll go to Jerry Jerry Jaila is that yes I'm seeing your hand yeah, I was uh, wondering if you have copies of the previous gas to shore studies done by the previous government that the public can view and have a better understanding of the project. But what we have seen so far is just a very, very brief summary. Hello? Yeah, did you hear me? Yeah, so you're wondering if, if you can access um, copies of the previous gas to shore um, project? The studies that were done by the previous government. All right, so um, what what I can say um, at this point is that the, the agency would be responsible for the documents that are primarily a part of our process in terms of um, what we make available to the public. Um, so our e the EIAs, the project summaries, I know that someone asked about the application. Of course, there are particulars of the application. 
um, that can be made available to the public in accordance with um, Section 36 of the Environmental Protection of the Environmental Protection Act. So um, the agency can only account for the. Please remember to mute your mics, everyone. The agency can account for the um, the specific documents that are related to um, the environmental authorization process in terms of what we make available to the public. Mike Carmack. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to comment here. Um, I think we have many questions at the Policy Forum, Guyana, who I'm representing on this call. Uh, but clearly, they, they can't all be dealt with you. And I'd just like to refer to one area that um, is of particular interest to us. Um, do you have uh, studies of the sea floor that this pipeline, at the mile deep, where this pipeline will commence, and what is the nature of the topography of the ocean floor? Does this pipeline have to bend? And are you thoroughly familiar with the uh, hazards that are possible? as was made clear last week in the Gulf, when methane spills from leaks from a gas pipeline set the ocean of a light. Could you tell us something about that? Thank you. Okay, um, Mike, thank you for your submission. So that um, is what the environmental impact assessment um, will capture and that is why we are having um, this this session. So uh, in terms of the details of that, um, of your question, that, that will be answered when the EIA is made available and we have the public disclosure meeting. But at this point, the, your question will not be answered because the study has not been um, conducted as yet in that regard. Rowena? Good afternoon, all uh, uh, um, concerned citizen here. Just forgive me if I might have missed it. I observe that Mr. Demico said that the location was predetermined, that is the location for the pipeline to come onto shore. It was predetermined by the government of Diana. Um, my question is at this point, where are the considerations for the impact that that quote unquote predetermined location, where are those considerations? When will the public have an idea of, you know, what they are, if, if any at all? So ideally, I am I'm, I'm thinking, forgive me and correct me, I think, I'm thinking that that in itself should have formed part of the questions that we ask. So what I would really like to know is how it is the government might have come up with this predetermined location and if that can be addressed. Um, the other thing is, I mentioned it in the chat, the economic evaluation for ecosystems. Ideally, this predetermined location should form part of that evaluation, as well as the other portions of ecosystem that will be impact impacted. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, um, Rowena. So if I can clarify with regards to your question, um, of course, in, there would have been initial um, feasibility, but the, the EIA also caters for um, alternatives. That, that's an important component of the environmental impact assessment. Um, so while they may be proposed location, um, the assessment will determine the other alternatives as well and what's the most what may be the most appropriate location um, in this regard uh, as it relates to um, and my response to you would be similar so um, the response I gave to Mike uh, in terms of the dissemination of um, information that are 
not um it's it's related but not uh not um directly a part of our process uh those will come from the relative sources um but at this point the agency will account for information that is a part of well forms part of the environmental authorization process all right so we note your concern and your comment um and and we will take it on board of course i am seeing maya and rama i'm not sure whose hand was up first but we'll take maya trots and rama prashant after maya go ahead um maya unmute yourself Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I, I think since we're not talking or allowed to talk about sort of the, the justification for the project, and we're just looking at this 27 page project summary that you have, can I see that one of the first things that you could just confirm with me is that the e EIA is required from the EPA. Uh, over the past few months, the EPA has just been approving lots of different projects without the requirement for the EIA. And I just need to know that we're in a process right now where the EIA is already required for this project. Can you just confirm yes, that? Um, Maya, correct. The EIA um, is required and with in the in determining sorry whether an EIA is required or not, the it, the project usually goes through a rigorous screening process and of course the agency published uh, that decision so the decision for an eia required for this project it was published so yes um to answer your question okay thanks so in terms of um of the process that you're doing now or the company is doing now you're trying to find out what what different things need to be covered in the eia based on the presentation that was given and the potential baseline study that would be done. Is that correct, Mr. Dr. or Mr. Demico? All right, so if I can um, respond to you. So the agency is required, the Environmental Protection Act requires us to publish a notice in at least one newspaper and give the public 28 days to make written submissions on what should be considered um for the eia study um questions and matters that they would like to be considered um however um given that this usually limits the public participation as a complementary to that process um the the agency have a, a policy where especially for major projects like these and for eia projects that the developers are um required to conduct public scoping meetings because um there may be issues or concerns that um, would be brought to the attention of the agency um, through engagement with uh, with various stakeholders and members of the public who may have um, integral knowledge of the area and so on. So this is complementary to that um, process to get the public um, involved in in a more meaningful way in the process rather than having you just send your written submissions to the agency okay that's great because i just want to make sure that the questions that we might have today does not necessarily say that we are endorsing this project we just have questions on on the 27 page document that has been shared without us actually knowing sort of the purpose um and the economic arrangements of this project so some of the questions that I would I I would have or you know someone has put in the chats already some of the concerns with things like your mercury waste from processing and I would be curious to know sort of how does EPA monitor regulate manage this stuff where is it going you speak about oily waste that is potentially truck truck to where where in Guyana is going to process the waste waste what kinds of volumes you're speaking about a stormwater detention basin to promote percolation I'm wondering where this is going to be located and what kind of soil you're thinking of because if you're on old sugar lands there is nothing really percolating um and so are we coming up with some sort of deep well injection to get rid of your waste and what are the um you know costs and so on and potential impacts on groundwater associated with things like that so i would say 
all of the studies that were shared in terms of the baseline studies, I would endorse doing all of them and, and actually doing studies where we have data that's shared. I've been reviewing some of the EIAs that are, that, are, that are being published for the oil and gas sector, and they're very limited on actual measurements, actual data. Uh, I would encourage that the EPA requires this, and it's not some sort of hypothetical situation with no measurements being made. Air quality, we want to see baseline data. Uh, sound baseline data, stormwater management baseline data. Um, and I, I agree with, with Dr. Mango, it's the moment when she was commenting, like I don't see how you could do the social impact and, in, and, and economic impact assessment without us actually knowing the cost to Guyanese and who owns what. So on the first part um, for the plant with the value add organics that you're producing, Who's selling that? Is that is that that's not the government owned facility? How is that being transported for sale? Uh, it talks about uh, to supply local demand. Is local demand enough? Um, and and sort of so just you know, and one part on the, the studies that you've included, um, that I just Google the document for the terms climate change, and so didn't see it anywhere. You are in a coastal area, so questions in terms of climate vulnerability and the placement of such a facility um, in an area that has potential for, for flooding. Uh, and you're so curious to know if you can include baseline studies looking at climate change vulnerability. So what are the, what does LIDAR data talk about in terms of the, the vulnerability of that area looking at climate models for this, for this region? things like you putting such a big plant, but your document speaks about on-site septic. I mean, could we think of some other type of more advanced wastewater treatment for your facility? You know, um, especially if you're thinking of this more, what you would might call advanced type um, uh, industrial development. So I would just be curious, uh, I'll, I'll try to attend some more of the meetings. I think it's really bare bones what we shared, we shared here today. I would also ask that the EPA shares the actual application. I don't know what the application has, but I've been in meetings with the EPA on these and it's sort of they're reviewing the application, they're reviewing the project summary, and they also have this screening document uh, where none of us know what the questions are in the screening. Uh, and it would be helpful if the public actually has access to everything that the EPA has access to. Um, the, the 27 pages is just really very limited. Um, for us to be having this this discussion. discussion. All right, thank you very much, Maya, for your insightful contribution. As it relates to the, the specifics of the application, as I mentioned, um, the, the act which governs how the agency operates, um, Section 36 has specific documents that should be made available to the public. Um, particulars of the application, if there are specific things that um, you would like to see in the application, uh, you can make that request to the agency and the agency will be guided by our legal team in terms of, of what should be available, made available. Thank you so much for your submission. Okay, Rama. Yeah, hello guys. Um, first of all, let me thank the speakers before me that proceeded with some excellent contributions, uh, Rowena, Maya, and Simone. Um, it's just a follow-up on, on some of the questions. My concern is, um, the, other than the EIA uh, assessment, is the economic impact uh, on this location. Is this the appropriate location for the efficacy of this project and the consumption of this gas for sure. Um, my concern is I'm wondering if it's a political decision based on the fact that this location is a, what we call a distress location based on what has happened um, in the past with the closure of this estate and so forth. And that's my only concern because I am from this area and um, you know I am monitoring what is happening there, but I don't know for sure whether the location of this gas to shore project is the appropriate location that can bring about the efficacy and the economic benefits in the long run um putting it at wheels um, that's my concern thank you all right thank you very much um rama so we won't be able to to speak 
um, with regards to, you know, other um, perceptions. Um, but, but what the agency will be making a decision on is based on the sound scientific evidence that will be provided by the environmental impact assessment. And as I mentioned earlier, um, one of the important components of an EIA is alternatives. And alternatives doesn't always have to be alternative that is related to location, but it can also be, um, it can also be design and um, it can also be the use of certain technology and based on the, the findings of the, of the EIA, um, that it, the decision will be made on whether or not, as you mentioned, that is the most appropriate location or, you know, it needs to go somewhere else. So um, that's the purpose of the EIA so that it can really um, be, in, it can inform, inform the decision making process. All right. So I see uh, Dow, Joyce and Dow, and I see David. David, so I take jo David. I take Joycelyn first, and um, followed by David. My name is Jocelyn. Joycelyn, please. Um, Jocelyn, sorry. Uh, speaking here as a citizen. Um, sorry, I'm 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 being corrected on your name. Um, but you said it's pronounced as Jocelyn, not Joycelyn. Yes, Jocelyn. No, if you look at the spelling. Okay. 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 Good. Thank now, you very much. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Um, the EPA will consider this project within what are your guidelines. Is this correct? What are your laws, your statutory things, your guidelines? Correct. Now, since those guidelines have been rolled back to 2002, what happens to those guidelines that emanated from a project that was done by WWF that did specifically look at enhancing the guidelines of the EPA to deal with oil and gas? How is it going to be considered in any rigorous way if your guidelines are limited to prior to anything to do with um, oil and gas? That's one question. Right. And, uh, and <clears throat> um, in terms of how it is you are going to be guided by all the comments and questions and suggestions made here today, are you going to present these to us, the public, in a new rollout of what it is, not just the recording, what is it that can in fact inform some of the new sessions you are planning to have in different communities? So is this going to be an alternative uh, process that can help to guide future consultations as well? Thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Doe, is that correct? That's correct. All right, so with regards to um, the guidelines, guidelines are guidelines um, as the name suggests. What the EPA does and of course, we're continuously um, updating and upgrading our our um, research and, and the um, technology and so on. The terms and scope that is developed for the study, which um, your contributions here today um, would help to craft um, that terms and scope, that is what will guide um, the study in addition to um, the act, which have the act has specific areas that the that an environmental impact assessment should cover right so in addition to the areas that are stipulated in the act the um the, the terms and scope that scope that will be crafted for um for that for the study will inform the environmental impact assessment so our decisions are not based on um outdated guidelines so to speak the guidelines were created to to guide the developer in terms of the specific areas that they need to adhere to. But the terms and scope is what will actually um, determine the extent um, of the environmental impact assessment. And um, just to answer your, your second question, 
uh, we are always seeking, of course, to improve our process um, as it relates to the engagement with the public. So yes, you mentioned whether there will be adjustments. So we, we adjust um, presentation, we adjust approaches and so on for um, follow-up scoping um, sessions. So based on the, 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 the submissions that are made here, uh, we will make adjustments as, as we proceed so that we can enhance that process, you know, as we go along. So yes, to answer that aspect. And I think you, you asked a question with regards to how your submissions will be considered. So um, the submissions today, along with all the other scoping meetings that we have in the various regions, as well as the written submissions that will be made um, to the agency, to the executive director. All those will be collated, um, compiled, analyzed, and those will be used to, um, will contribute as a matter of fact, to the crafting of the terms and scope for the environmental impact assessment. Thank you. All right. You're welcome, ma'am. So, David, it's your turn. Okay, thank you very much. Um, also, uh, thanks to the presenters and uh, all the people who have talked so far, uh, learned quite a lot. Um, I have two comments and questions in, in areas. One specific. I'm sorry, David. I'm um, sorry. Um, I'm half to interrupt you, but if you could use it. Where you're representing, if you're representing an organization or? or no, no, I'm just okay. a interested okay. Chinese, yes. Okay, go ahead. Yes, and uh, so the two areas, one is specifically for the EIA and it, it, it's in regard to the process that you use to evaluate this. I mean, uh, to, be, to be fair, I think this is a very large and complex uh, process just as the the actual uh, oil exploration and, uh, and production is. And so, uh, of course, making sure that uh, the evaluation process and the parameters used in the evaluation are, are up to par because in, 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 a, in essence, uh, if they're not, you know, you're gonna be either accepting or denying based on something that may or may not be quite on target, so I think that it's it it should be important that you guys give us some more uh, clarity at, on those parameters. For instance, uh, if you uh, decide to land the pipeline at position A or position B, what are the parameters that the EIA uses to evaluate whether or not site A or site B is appropriate? And how does that compare to the parameters that ExxonMobil would be using? Because I'm sure they have their own parameters that would say it's better to land it at site A. And if you come up with site B, what are the differences and how do we address that? The other area that I think is important is for some more transparency and clarity on the process that you, uh, the EIA uses in terms of feedback. So we get all these questions and comments, but what are the actual results of those questions and comments? Which ones are acted on and which ones are not acted on? And what are the results of those? So that I think is something that the EIA should really focus on in terms of clarity and in terms of being uh, transparent to the uh, Guyanese public uh, with respect to giving them some good information. The second set of questions I have is really uh, targeted toward uh, Mr. D'Amico. And it, first of all, it relates to the scope. Uh, and what I'm interested in is I've seen a lot of comments or a lot of actual documentation that says the scope or the design basis is based on 50 million standard cubic feet of gas. And if we were to convert that into energy and compare it to typical publications of Guyanese overall uh, energy demand, that which is about, if I remember right, 800 megawatts uh, in, in the area of that, what is the difference between those two numbers with respect to energy value? And uh, can you say 
if the the delivered gas is gonna just be targeted at local needs or is it going to be split between local and other industrial needs uh that's the that's one one question and then from a a growth standpoint if if you look just at the uh very good successes that exxon mobil and maybe others will have with respect to oil fines we can expect that there would be more gas to be either re-injected or to be sent forward to to a processing facility like we have here. Is there any expandability in the current design of the line? Is that line enough just for the 50 billion standard cubic feet? Or are we looking to, uh, have we designed in some expandability with respect to the full capacity of that line? And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, David. For the other persons who are not speaking, please remember to have your mic muted. All right. Yes, yeah, so um, just to respond to a few of your questions um, before I um, hand the platform briefly over to D'Amico who would shed some clarity. As it relates to the, the EIA and the parameters um, that are used to assess the EIA, um, what, what is important to note is that EIA projects are um, participatory and it involves the public um, to a great extent. So the EIA, once the EIA is, uh, is available, uh, the agency has to publish that notice um, and, and inform the public that the EIA was submitted submitted to the agency and, as well as, and we also make it available for members of the public to peruse. As complementary to that, um, similar to what we're doing here for the um, the pre-TOR, in, in terms of the scoping session, there are also disclosure sessions. So um, that's where the specific questions um, and recommendations will be addressed. Um, so you're asking whether or not you, how, how you would know if some of your questions or if your recommendations were actually taken into, into consideration. Um, you will know um, at that stage, and at that stage, it's not it's not too late because the EIA um, can also be revised if there are specific gaps and there are pertinent questions that were missed in the process. Um, it can be revised um, to address those specific areas. So there's also another there's there's also another opportunity um, for public engagement, and the, the EIA is a public document, and you know you can peruse it at any time and we make it available to the public, um, especially during that, uh, that 60 day review period and thereafter, but the 60 day period for public comments. So you can submit comments as well during that period, similar um, as you would do here for the, for the TOR. When the EIA is submitted to say, you know, there, there are some areas that I think were not adequately addressed and they need to be addressed before um, the document is finalized or the document um, may not be accepted um, based on, on the, the scope of the study and how, how the, cons the consultants would have and the developer would have adhered to the terms and scope of the, the, that was produced for the study. So um, this is a very inclusive process and it, it, um, it involves the public at various stages. Now, in addition to these meetings, um, the developer and their consultants are also required to conduct stakeholder consultation. Um, that is more in-depth consultation with specific categories of stakeholders, of course, who may be affected um, by this project in some way or the other. So these are, you know, more sort of general public meetings, but in the, the EIA itself, more rigorous um, strategic uh, stakeholder consultations would be required. 
Um, Domiko, you wanted to make uh, any submission with regards to the second aspect on the scope, any other areas you want to clarify? I do want to say I do appreciate, you know, the, the comments and the questions that have been raised. Uh, you know, one stood out uh, amongst the others, uh, Mr. McCormick, as it relates to kind of the offshore implications uh, and the studies that will be carried out. And as indicated, those those are important. I'm a marine biologist. I uh, have a lot of passion in this area, in the environment, uh, in environmental areas. So. Uh, with that being said, that these this is definitely the reason. I'm glad to see almost 100 people calling into this virtual session uh, to bring this and raise these comments and concerns to the EPA. That will review them uh, and you know appropriately put them into the the terms and scope for the work to be carried out. And the as mentioned, this is is quite early in the process. I know there's a lot of questions as it relates to commercial about the. Uh, generation of the the power plant and where sales may go and, and things of that nature but uh, unfortunately at this time this is specifically more on the environmental the uh, socioeconomic and the the physical impacts uh, there was also a question as it relates to the pipeline route uh, it, that is part of this EIA uh, if, uh, if I mistook or miss uh, spoke earlier it wasn't uh, included uh, the EIA will cover the offshore uh, pipeline onshore and the NGL facility area, which is approximately 40 acres in, 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 in size. And there's on, will be ongoing on, in the approvals and permitting process for some of the geotechnical and geophysical work that has to be carried out so that uh, uh, the EPA, EEPGL, other related agencies understand what the areas uh, that this, uh, this project may impact are better understood. That's exactly uh, why we start this process very, very early in the in the in the cycle. So I appreciate that, and um, looking forward to additional conversations as we have this the EIA process, which lasts uh, quite a bit of time. So as uh, Ms. Ken, uh, Brower Thompson said, we do have other opportunities to have these conversations. Thank you. Thank you, Cherry. Yeah, uh, last week we saw a burning gas fire um, somewhere in the Gulf of Mexico. So that should send shivers up our spines in Guyana. Uh, it took five hours for them to put that fire out. You know, in Guyana we have fire engines go to fire without any water. <laughs> and so I don't know if the EPA is concerned um, about things like that and if Exxon has proper insurance. On the matter of oil, Exxon has so far refused to say and to make comment whether it is carrying full insurance for the current oil operation because many of the experts that have made um, commentary on the issue feels that Exxon does not carry um, full insurance and it may be using a shell company through which um, it is doing any insurance if it has any. And so I'm thinking we should not approve any new project unless Exxon releases full, complete documentation of what insurance it is carrying now and what proposed insurance it will carry for the new um, gas project. If we cannot manage oil, which we have now, how is Guyana that is so ill-prepared and has very little capacity and monitoring ability be able to take on a new big project that has 220 miles of um, pipelines? It's a big job and we need full disclosure. We need full transparency. And for all those people who are asking if that's the right location for the project in Wales, we need to see the studies that were done by the previous government. So that we need complete transparency and complete uh, disclosure of this project. All right, Jerry, thank you for your submission. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the EPA can account for the areas that are relative to its process and, it's, and, and as it relates to um, environmental authorization and financial assurance and so on. Um, the EPA has the polluter pays principle and our, um, our permit will capture um, 
where that that aspect of it where where you know the pollutant is required to, to to pay for any any harm or so that is caused so that that is an area that is you know it's not new um to us and and we have been addressing it so are you saying that epa is saying they have full complete insurance right now for the oil operation no i'm not saying that i'm saying um that the epa can only account for our permit and what and the financial coverage that has to be done in in that regard and um if you need this specific information the permits um the permits are available um on our website so i don't want to um to go into the details of that because we want to keep you know the discussion in the context of this meeting that we're having of this project so you can see um what we have in those permits for the previous development of projects. But it would be nice if Exxon answered questions because it's a matter that's being uh, written about in the press over and over and Exxon is silent. So why would, should we give them another big project and they keep being silent on us? What do they have to hide? Do they have anything to hide? Talk to the people of Guyana. Like you're, you're having these meetings across the country Talk to the people whether you have insurance now. We want to trust you as a good partner in development. Ghana is not the enemy of Exxon. And to treat us like friends of the same family and give us full disclosure and talk to us if you have full coverage and give us all the, the, the details. Because when we saw that gas fire burning in uh, Mexico, that that's going to cause Guyanese to wonder about this new project that Exxon wants to do. All right, I understand your your concerns, um, Jerry, and of course that will have to be at a separate forum that um, Exxon could, um, well, EPGL can address some of those other issues that are not a part of the, the current process. Um, but a, we just to keep the discussions within um, the ambit of the environmental authorization process. We I know there are other questions that will come up and other concerns, but um, we don't want to you know deviate um, too much on that because um, some of those things don't fall under our purview. Uh, I'm Simone. Is it that your hand is up? for a second round or did you not um, take it down? It's up for a second round. Okay, go ahead. So having listened to this and the response from uh, Mr. Miko, I just want to state for the record that I believe that this EIA cannot be conducted without elementary information, which you are categorizing as commercial and uh, it's a false boundary that's being drawn, first of all. We're not asking for secrets, we're asking for basic information that ought to be available to the public. And that is who owns the gas, who owns the pipeline, who's financing the pipeline, who will sell the processed gas, what kind of facilities will they be needing and to whom are they selling, is it a local market or a foreign market? And how much dry gas is going to go into the power plant that's mentioned? What is the demand in the country for that dry gas? And if it doesn't exist, what then will happen to the excess gas? Will it then spur other industries and can they potentially be dirty industries? So these are fundamental questions that to my mind cannot be dismissed as commercial issues. Secondly, it is preposterous to suggest that the purpose of an EIA is about where you put a pipeline. That cannot be the case. The purpose of this project cannot be stated as putting a pipeline. The question must be, why are we putting a pipeline? And if we can look at alternatives for achieving the same objectives, and those alternatives may be using a compressed getting compressed gas and bringing it by boats and you selling it to other markets potentially trinidad has a very well developed gas field system and atlantic lng gas it may mean we don't end up with a dry gas glut on guy in guyana there are so many options including do nothing alternatives so when i was listening to a, 
uh, Candace from the EPA narrow down what we can imagine to be alternatives. But the, the thought that comes to my mind is that this is a deeply flawed consultative process. And, and I'm sure that the, the company that is responsible for it has done EIAs and must understand what are minimum standards for participation from the particular basic information that ought to be available, from how one frames what the objectives are, and then therefore how one can begin to look at the impacts. And I'm saying this with two things in mind. The first is I'm very mindful that the EPA announced to the public of Guyana that it was no longer going to be using the 2020 guidelines that were developed, which brought its systems and processes up to date. It announced this on June 26th, one day before this oil to shore, gas to shore project became open for the public. Now, I don't think coincidence happen in the world. What I feel is that you have done that in a way that now allows us to have the largest onshore facility be completely done outside of the refinement that those guidelines provide to the existing 2000 laws. And this is not acceptable. It says that the EPA is going to consult on these guidelines and the correct thing to do is to consult on them, have them in place, and then trigger this EIA process. I'm particularly sorry for the company that has to manage it because you are inserted in a process that is so flawed that it will end in a judicial review. And right now, this particular segment of it, which is looking for comments on TORs, is already deficient by any standard, any law, and any decision taken in the common, on the common law in Belize or Trinidad, etc. So I would urge you to do the following. Revise, before you conduct another session like this, revise your project description with the basic information that it is lacking and provide the details of all of the facilities that are going to be necessary if you're selling the, the gas or you're, you're sending dry gas. We need to know what that's gonna look like. And also within your description, it says that you're not considering the public, the, the, the power plant because that's a government of Guyana project but it is deeply rooted in this pipeline business because we don't need a power plant if we don't have a pipeline. Um, so we need to treat that together with this. It cannot be jettisoned so that you shade the true impact of this on the taken. And you must understand, Guyana is an incredibly poor country with terrible leadership since independence. And at this point, every citizen is at the point where we have to stand up to govern our own country every single day. It's exhausting. But this particular one, this particular project is the straw on the camel's back because we're watching you and we're not happy. We don't disrespect you. We want to support you. We want the company to do the best job possible, but it's important to listen. And we're not the kind of people that you're going to say, oh, that's commercial and it's not in the scope. So the first feedback is your scope is wrong. You need to define the scope better. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Simone. And uh, this is why we are having you know this 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 public session um this scoping session where we can get um concerns um like yours very um insightful very profound um to contribute in a meaningful way to this process um i just wanted to well, not correct you, but just to clarify, when I mentioned alternatives, I didn't um, go into an exhaustive list. I was I was just um, mentioning some of the areas because most persons would think that alternatives mean an alternative location. So, and what I want to thank you for is that you made um, some very profound recommendations on the way forward. So, thank you very much, um, Simone. I don't know if David... And Vonda, if your hands are up again or you didn't uh, yes, I, take I, I it down. Second, uh, set of questions. So it's Dave. Sorry? Yes, I do have a second set of questions. Okay. Go ahead. So it's David, Vonda, and then Danita. I hope I have that correct. Go ahead, David. Okay. Um, so uh, just to revisit the question again about 
design basis. And partially uh, the reason for that question does relate to uh, environmental impact in the sense that it, it kind of defines the level of emissions you would have. So depending on how much gas is being fed in the line, uh, whether it's from the source or where it comes out, there's some set of emissions that would be associated with those points. Uh, and so uh, we would have to understand the impact of those particular emissions. And the second part of my question kind of tags along with an earlier question that uh, asked about the uh, dynamics of the pipeline, especially in the deep part of the ocean. And my question is related to what
the dust, the in micro brothers said the fire, the ocean going on fire, number one. What about if there is a gas explosion right where there are communities are located around and, and in Wales? What is the evacuation plan? What is the insurance? This is a very vital question. Exxon has been extremely dark on anything to do with insurance and assurance. And this is a key matter. It cannot be excluded in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in an ESIA because this is where it's affecting humans. And finally, the 2020 guidelines, come on. You have to include guidelines that are the most up-to-date. You can't just politically decide to exclude something done by a former government, let me be blunt. All of these, the most recent um, iterations of the guidelines that would include some kind of looking at oil and gas, they absolutely need to be uh, taken on board. And, and you know, just don't duck, just don't duck these kind of um, of questions. Um, and that the entire thing must be um, inclusive. And that, as someone said, I think it was Simone just now. We are not the kind of people on this call here, the hundred of us or whatever, that are going to take these matters lightly and be shut down by these kind of half baked answers. I know they're sincere, Miss EPA. But come on, you know, we are going to be watching and we are not going to let this rest until we have something the citizens of this country can really buy into. At the moment, no, we are not. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Ms. Radzik. Am I pronouncing your name correct? Hello? Yes, Wanda, go ahead, Savitri. Yes, uh, yes, Ms. Radzik, concerning your questions regarding the produce water from the FPSO, um, I would just like to highlight that the FPSOs are permitted under a separate EIA project, which impacts related to produce water have been addressed in those documents. Um, this project concerns the transportation of the gas from the FPSO to the facilities onshore. So the EIA will have a section that will address cumulative impacts, which will take into consideration the impacts from all waste streams, from projects, exploration and production projects in the Stabrook block, as well as other blocks offshore. Also, regard with regards to flaring, the EIA for this project, the terms of reference will also re mandate or stipulate that discussions regarding the amounts, circumstances under which flaring will occur, and alternatives to reduce any flaring that may occur will have to be addressed in that document. Management plans, evacuation plans, emergency response plans, all of those will have to be prepared and form part of the EIA study. The terms and scope for which we are here today will capture all of these comments. So for example, you've uh, personally made mention to management plans, emergency plans, all of that will be contained in the EIA. Some answers we may not have at the moment because I would just like to reiterate that the EI has not been conducted as yet. So just putting that out there for your consideration. Monitoring protocols will be part of the EI as well. Once that document is submitted to us, we will review to ensure whatever was raised here today is included in that document. Do I provide some level of clarity with regards to the issues? Thank you, Savitri. Savitri is a senior environmental officer within the oil and gas unit at the EPA. Um, so um, like she rightly mentioned, many of the, the questions and considerations um, that you're making today, um, those are for the EIA, which is to be done. Right, so um, just to, just to, to clarify that 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 issue, 
and produce water, of course, that is an integral part um, of the EIA. Um, and we've had it being raised in, in, in other projects. And of course, it is um, another critical area for this proposed project. Donita and Mike. So I'll take the Danita, Danita first. And is it Danita or Donita? I hope I pronounced the name correctly. And um, Candace, thank you. It's Danuta. Danuta, sorry. Okay. So, Go ahead, uh, Danuta. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Me, I'm I'm a citizen of Guyana, and um, I have some comments and some questions. So, as a citizen of Guyana, where I live, and if um, it is determined that the pipeline will go at Wales, then I, as a citizen of Guyana um, and a resident of Guyana, I will be affected by anything that goes wrong or any adverse effects of this pipeline, this proposed pipeline, right? So I speak from that context. Um, but I also want to mention something because we are having this consultation and the EIA, um, the EPA is facilitating this um, conversation that we are having. But I think you have to appreciate also that as citizens, we have been seeing a process happening in Guyana in relation to many projects associated with oil and gas where EIAs have not occurred. So just a slight um, diversion here. So for example, shore base, Guyana shore base that stretches from Houston um, Estate, Houston Village and goes all the way up on the side of the Demerara River to um, Eccles, maybe even further, right? Um, an EIA was done of shore base. It was funded by the IDB. I have read that 294 page EIA, and it was quite shocking to me that the section on stakeholder um, involvement um, mentioned that altogether there were 11 people who were actually had any um, they, they had any opportunity to be to be part of any stakeholder consultation on this. And of that small 11 group, um, it consisted of government officials, business people, and I assume some residents. I live right next door to Shore Base. The only thing that separates my house from Shore Base is a road an access road, not even the main East Bank Road. Yet, we were never informed or asked, you know, to be part of any consultation. And obviously, um, if anything happens adversely in relation to shore base, and it, that might be happening as we speak, um, then we would be directly affected. So I'm just saying that, you know, Candace, we're having this, but you have to understand that for many of us in Ghana who live, live in communities where we are hearing that various facilities are being put down and shore bases are being established, etc. We have not got an opportunity very often to really be able to be informed of the um, particular e even EIAs for shore base had their EIA. Um, we were not consulted. Yet we will be the first in line in, in case of everything, um, you know, any adverse reactions, any spill, you know, any release of hazardous things, um, you know, radioactive sources of, or etc. We will be the first in line. Um, so I just um, kind of wanted to put it within that context. But my other thing has to do with the this EIA, and I'm glad that this process is much superior, Candace, to the other processes um, where these plan, these um, facilities are being placed right in the middle of communities or community. 
So I'm glad that this process is wider and we are being given the opportunity um, to be able to speak. Um, my other point is, and this is a question, um, and um, unfortunately I could not be here at the start of it, so I might have missed this. But I would like to know, um, because I, I, in, in, my, in, in my view, there should be some separation when an EI, the EIA is being conducted between the consultants or the firm who, who, are, who are doing the, the EIA or who have been identified or chosen to do the EIA and the actual company of which the EIA is being done because it is their op operations, right? Um, right, so I want to know about that separation because I think it's critical because we see all the time very often where um, EIAs can be done, but um, the, the company itself who are going to be, um, you know, doing the facility, um, you know, in charge of the, um, the um, pipeline or whatever, they actually fund and find the person to do the EIA. I think having a separation and being assured that this is a, these are independent consultants and independent experts who would be doing it is very, very important and necessary for Guyanese to have any, like me as a citizen, you know, to have any confidence in this process. My last point has to be that, my last point has to do um, to remind everyone here that um, not too long ago, I think it was this year, the president of Guyana signed um, a regional agreement on access to information, public participation, and justice in environmental matters in Latin America and the Caribbean. It's called a SCAZU agreement. Um, it is also an enforceable agreement, right? And therefore we in Guyana, our president has signed this, so this now becomes part of how we should be functioning. Therefore, I would like to just uh, mention some things about Escazu here, right? Because... Um, um, sorry, um, Danita. Danuta. Danuta, sorry. Sorry I, um, to interrupt you. Um, I'm familiar with the Escazu agreement, so I will just um, speak to that in the context of the reference you're making. Um, but if you have any other um, specific question um, or recommendations relative to this project, you can make um, that submission. I, you, you spoke about some other areas as it relates to shore base um, services and so on, um, which is out of the scope of this project. And our we have a, a statutory obligation in accordance with the Environmental um, Protection Act as it relates to how the EIA is administered and all of that. Um, you mentioned independent consultants. Yes, uh, the Act requires independent consultants um, approved by the EPA. The Act also requires that everything relative to the conduct of the EIA, the, the cause, the, um, the developer stands that cause. So there are some specific um, statutory obligations that we have that cannot be um, changed unless you know the Act is revised and so on. Um, so just, just to underscore that we are working in the ambit of, of, of the Environmental Protection Act and as it relates to other projects um, outside the scope of this, there are also statutory obligations there where notices are published, whether it's um, 30 days um, for a non-EIA project and the, the public has that time to make appeals on the agency's decision. And that is um, that process is governed by a separate body, the Environmental Assessment Board, that listens to those appeals and so on and make a final decision. So, uh, if there are like other areas, like if you have other concerns with other projects, you can take probably take that separately in terms of um, sending your concerns to the executive director, and um, we can address that outside of this forum. But we want to to keep. Um, the meeting we just have um, about a few minutes, about 20, 25 yes, but, minutes but, remaining. But Candace, my, uh -huh. my point is, and I would like to go back to Escazu because what it says, right, 
is that it starts you, you have to ensure this is the law of Guyana, now it is part of how Guyana should be operating. Ensure the public's right to participation and also to ensure that they can understand whatever is going to be in the EIA in a way that that is clear because at the end of the day, it is not going to be Mr. Dimico, it is not going to be Mr. Crispin, and it's not going to be the owners of Exxon Mobil who will be affected if anything in this goes wrong. It is us, and therefore, we are primary stakeholders. We are primary stakeholders, and I would hope, and as you said, everything all the questions that are being raised should be documented it doesn't matter if you are an expert or you are a housewife or you are a student we are all valuable we are all Guyanese and we all have a right to be heard and to give our views on something that will affect us thank you Correct. Right. Thank you very much. And that's why we are, we are providing this opportunity for you to do just that. And we are we are grateful. I just wanted to, to highlight briefly, though, that um, because the ESCAZU is a regional agreement of the, the national laws, um, you know, take precedence in that regard. But um, we are working on improving our public engagement and public participation process, um, as you rightly mentioned, in terms of the, the documents that are available in the format that they're available in and the accessibility of them and so on. So thank you very much um, for, your, for your submissions in this regard. I see Mike. I think that's, the, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if David, David's hand is up again or no, not this time. Um, okay. okay. Just okay. excuse me. Good I... afternoon, everybody. Miss Candacy, um, I don't think Mr. Green Harry knows how to do the hands up, but he's he's showing his hand. So if and he was before everybody else that's at the top. So if we could give him a chance. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, um, moderator. I'm not I'm not seeing the entire screen. So thank you for that, uh, Mr. Harry. Well, you can go ahead and yes. we'll yes. take. Thank you very much. My name is. Sorry Dr. about that. Yes. It's okay. It's Gerd Harry. Um, <clears throat> I have listened very carefully from the beginning, and I'm very impressed with the moderator, the presenter, and all the other contributors. Very uh, articulate in the presentation. Very knowledgeable also. Having said that, I have have to let you premise what I'm saying by saying that I have written about oil. Um, in the Guyana Press uh, a few times and my story is <clears throat> that listening to all the people who spoke here today and I am not going to get away from the fact that you have a scope to address the scope of your of this meeting is addressing one specific issue my position is however that um, that I don't agree with what you're talking about. Um, I'm against it because I don't know if we are going to get this oil. Whose oil is it, first of all? Is it Diana's oil or is it Exxon's oil? And the other point is, why are we negotiating and asking all these questions about money and oil and where the pipeline is going? <clears throat> Where the pipeline is going? Do we need a pipeline? No, we don't even need a pipeline. There should be no pipeline in the first place. I my mean, son of it drastic and, and um, extreme, but that's the fact. But what is the point of negotiating if the climate change will sink us all in the final analysis? Bearing in mind also that the oil companies know about, about the effect of oil, CO2, in relation to public health issues, and not only human, in terms of um, all life forms in this world. So um, it's not a case of where I am saying that go ahead, do this or do that or the other. All I'm saying is that it should not be done in the first place. Some people are asking for renegotiation, and I understand that. 
other than that, I can say that um, okay, what what is it a fait accompli? Can it be redone? Can it not? Can it be undone? Is there a latent defect in the contractual agreement? I heard about Escazo, and there has been Escazo is a very pertinent, real thing. The president uh, um, Ali talked about it, reported in the newspaper uh, openly, and um, but the public posturing is antithetical to what Escazo is saying. So I am very, very disturbed by what I'm hearing today. Um, bearing in mind that the moderator is doing what she's supposed to do, um, discussing the matter within the, the scope of what it is intended to. Um, <clears throat> so, apart from this Zoom meeting, which is a good thing, this kind of discussion should be carried out within Guyana. I'm, with, I'm in New York City. Um, I'm Guyanese. And, but also to the general public, not by Zoom meeting only, within reasonableness across the country. Because my thing that people do not know, if people were being told or being fed the truth, real truth, not propagandizing truth, they will answer the question differently from what the president and the vice president, who seems to be a PR man for the oil companies. <laughs> Sorry to see negative, but this is how I feel. Thank you. All thank you for your, your submission. And I, I don't know if you were here from the inception, but um, yes, this, we're, we're actually having a hybrid in terms of the approach to, to getting the public involved. So there are physical meetings in the regions. Um, there were two in Barbies yesterday. Um, there, there are meetings in region one and so on region two, um, but this is a complimentary because we, we want to capitalize on the technology as well and, you know, get to persons who may not be able to make it to any of those physical locations. Yeah. Yeah, so the, 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 the screen um, is being shared with the schedule, but thank you very much um, and, and we respect and value your contribution. May I say something? Yes, go ahead. Yes, I, I was saying that um, in, in response to what you're saying here, the lady from who is living not far from uh, where this thing is supposed to be made the very relevant point because she's affected directly. And we have what should also happen is that people should uh, elicit the advice expertise of people of other people Guyanese or otherwise from wherever they are not only government spokesperson who's talk about uh, mangrove must be cut down and it is ridiculous that's a government man a government person talking about all the benefit and the word development and growth should be used advisedly because they are dangerous word with very hidden meanings one other person uh, noted, um, uh, I think he's an engineer. He also talked about the safety of mangrove that it could be cut down for development. And people don't know that mangrove, well, firstly, nothing should be cut down. People are silent about the cutting down of the, the tree, the big trees in the Mabaruma. Nobody has said, been outspoken. They allow things to just lie and slide, hoping that people forget. We must take into cognizance the fact that these things harm the, the ordinary man or woman on the street, on Main Street, not uh, not in the inner inner um, circle of, <clears throat> of government and um, other uh, people in high places. So I want to uh, uh, say, and I agree with the lady, and I agree with the lady Mongol, I can't remember her name. She made some very, very useful um, points about it. The relevance. And my position again, I have to reiterate that it is I am totally against it, and therefore I speak from that perspective. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. So, um, David Singh and David Mudis, I'm not sure if I have it correctly, um, but the hello, can they see? That, my that. name was called before. Oh, Mike, sorry, yes, yes. Go ahead, Mike. 
Like, Thank you. Or... I, it just won't be very long. I initially put my hand up to ask when the original question asked by um, Simone Mangle was going to be answered. But in the meantime, Simone has uh, in detail uh, dealt with, with that. But I still find that this question is directed at the uh, EPA's understanding of what it's actually doing in, the, in these consultations. These consultations have no legal base. The Zoom is not mentioned in the statute covering EPA. And before consultations take place, there's supposed to be a document. So it's been made clear these consultations uh, don't fall within the normal EPA procedures. This is something different. The impression I had was that the difference was that this was going to be allow a broader range of concerns to be at least put on the table, if not re responded to. But there has been a constant uh, ruling of, of issues as if this were a formal consultation, as if the narrow and rather timid approach of the EPA to this consultation was that it can't stray beyond the statutory bounds of what will come later. And so it's my advice to the EPA. And oddly enough, Mr. D'Amico seems a lot more comfortable and cool with answering questions than the EPA do in receiving them. And my advice for the rest of this consultation is, if this is going to be credible, EPA has to acknowledge that it is doing a public service here by allowing or providing the uh, company in this case with a platform that could address at least some of the issues that may come up within the um, later EIA or that EPA itself could anticipate will come and which they could prepare for. But the presentation that the conduct of this, of this Zoom and this is not personal to Candace. I, I, she's the sort of messenger of the EPA position. It's not her devising. Um, it's, it's not at all satisfactory. And uh, we would strongly urge that the uh, a much more open and flexible approach be allowed because there has been no public consultation on this and the EPA should not allow itself to be used as... Um, a, a sort of a alternative way of avoiding a public discussion. Thank you. All right. So thank you, Mike. So the mere fact that um, and and you said it um, clearly just now. I, I thought I wasn't understood from the inception. Where this 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 public scoping meeting that we're having, it's complementary to that public notice that is published that requires you to make written submissions to the agency. And as you rightly said, to garner um, greater concerns um, from the public to help craft the terms and scope that will be used for the conduct of the environmental impact assessment. All right, so um, you are correct about that in terms of the EPA want, wants to, we, we value public involvement and um, we, we see this as an opportunity for the developer, of, of course, to share um, information, pertinent information on the proposed on the proposed project. Um, I'm not sure which aspect you are not satisfied with. I think I responded to the question relative to the regional agreement, um, the Escazu, that it's a regional agreement and what um, is enshrined in the national law will, will take precedence. Um, of course, we are continuously um, working um, with international best, best practices to you know up our engagement. I also mentioned that this is not um, this 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 does not mean that detailed consultations will not be conducted during the um, the EIA itself. So this is a preliminary um, scoping meeting, as you said, to gather your your comments, your concerns, your recommendations. However, when the, the terms and scope are crafted, the the, the stakeholder um, consultation and management plan we'll have to identify a specific group of stakeholders where in-depth consultations will be conducted. So as you would you would concur that the scope of um, of engagement varies 
based on the um, the, the stage that the project is at, right? So uh, this stage here is the, the scoping stage, and this, this is the preliminary discussion to hear from you, right? Um, so we thank you very much. I'm not sure which aspect you said wasn't, um, wasn't responded to adequately, um, but I can, you can type it in the chat or I can, I can, I can come back to you if you want to share, but I'll go head over to, I'll hand the, the, the microphone, the virtual mic over to Dr. Singh, um, David Singh, and I'm also seeing fan the hand up. I'm not sure if it's, if it's, um, from the previous or, or your hand is up now. So go ahead, um, David Singh. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Candace. Uh, I, I want to, of course, recognize that this, uh, this project here is, I believe, the largest ever project in Guyana's history. Uh, it's a $900 million price tag. It eclipses everything else we might have, um, uh, might have dreamt of before. And it's not the full project. Um, it's only landing gas on the shore and uh, passing it through um, that the facility that will cause the separation for further use. I have three, uh, bef well, the, uh, before I asked uh, very, three very specific questions of the EPA, I just want to recognize that, um, that we I'm represent WWF. Um, I'm here with my colleague, Aisha Williams, who manages our office in, in Guyana. Uh, they, we will be making a detailed um, uh, contribution submission to the EPA um, regarding this project. The three questions I have for the EPA are, one, will the EPA make these hearings available for the public record uh, so that the society will be able to evaluate the extent to which the concerns that the public has raised, the extent to which those have been actually considered in the, in the conduct of the ESIA. So will the EPA make these hearings available for the public record? The second question, is the EPA satisfied that it knows who the developer is and who the owner is of this project? And is there a distinction between the developer and the owner of this project? And my third question, is the EPA satisfied that the alternatives required to be considered in accordance with section 11.5 of the act, if these alternatives um, have been identified or will be identified and this and their treatment will be adequate and sufficient in the conduct of the ESIA. So the three questions to repeat them, will, the, will these hearings be made available to the public? Who is the owner versus the developer? And thirdly, um, are, is the EPA satisfied with the alternatives that will be considered in this process? Thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Singh. I'll answer your second question, Mr. Savitri Itwaru here. Um, yes, the EPA is satisfied. Um, we, prior to the submittal of this application, there were numerous meetings conducted between the relevant parties, number of questions asked regarding same points that you have raised. And yes, we would have received our answers. And so the EPA is satisfied if we were not satisfied, then we would not have accepted the application and proceeded with the EIA process. So who are the people? Exactly. May I, may I follow that I? up um, <laughs> with a comment? So the develop who the, so the de, is the developer and the owner one and the same? And um, Savitri, would you be able to tell us who the developer and owner is or are, please? Um, as per the application, the developer uh, is EEPGL. They um, are the applicants of this project and should the EPA proceed 
to issue any authorization following um, all the necessary requirements met, then yes, the permit would be issued to EEPGO. So yes, essentially the developer and the owner are the same for this particular project. That is a gas pipeline and the facility onshore, the LNG plant. Thank you, um, Dr. Singh. Is it clear? And just to, to respond to the, I think it was the first question you had um, with regards to the, the alternatives. So um, those of course will be captured in the EIA study to be conducted. And as you rightly mentioned, based on the, the evaluation of those alternatives, um, the most feasible um, option will be um, recommended or, or will be selected. If I could, uh, I'm sorry to be looping back. And so uh, my, it was a very specific question. Um, uh, is the EPA satisfied that the alternatives required to be considered in accordance with the law will be adequate and sufficient? Are you satisfied with that? And then secondly, the other question was, will the EPA make these hearings uh, available for the public record? Thank you. So the, the public scope and meetings, they are um, well public. So we, we will work with our IT team to see um, the best way in which we can make um, this, how it's been recorded here, it's, it's audio um, in the best means of which we can make it available for persons who may not have been able to attend the session, um, of course, to follow. So that, um, that can be done, it, it's, it's, um, it's a public meeting. So there's, there's, there are no challenges in that regard. And the question on alternatives, uh, is um, the EPA Okay, satisfied? so um, Dr. Say, if I may answer the question regarding alternatives. So the EPA, we're the ones that are setting the terms and scope. So we have to stipulate in that terms of reference, the various types of alternatives we would like to see captured, including a no project alternative. So we will be guided in accordance with the act as it pertains to requirements with respect to alternatives. So at this point in time, we cannot pronounce on our satis um, satisfaction because we have not uh, prepared that terms and scope as yet. We are now in the process of doing that. So the EPA, I, must, I want to reiterate again, the EPA, we're the ones that are setting the terms and scope. That is why it is important for us to gather all the concerns that we are hearing here today. We are not, we, we are not here just to um, note it down. We are looking at these concerns and we will incorporate them in the terms and scope, which will be the document that will guide the preparation of the EIA. So once that EIA is submitted, then we will analyze the alternatives that are presented in that document and then we will make a recommendation as to whether or not we are satisfied with what has been proposed in the EIA. Thank you, um, Savitri. And I assume, Dr. Singh, you have some recommendations for alternatives to be considered. So you did mention that you're going to send the written submission. So um, be sure to include um, that aspect in the submissions you will be making to the agency. I don't see any more hand. Can the money? David Mudis, is it that your hand is up again or? Yes, uh, I do okay. have. So I see David and I see Mike um, Passad. The technicians can help me if I'm missing anyone. Um, are those the only two hands? Um, yes, yes those, yeah. those are the only two I'm seeing. All right, so go ahead, um, David and following you, we'll take Mike Passan. Okay, and uh, I think uh, this question again uh, is both for EPA and uh, 
mm. uh, also for uh, the gentleman, uh, Mr. McCormick, um, the, the Michael, sorry. Um, in general, uh, Guyana has, uh, over the past few years, published uh, what they call the Green Sustainable Strategy. And um, this strategy has talked a lot about, you know, reducing emissions and uh, going down a sustainable path, meaning things like renewable energy and other things. Um, so this this uh, gas project does provide again a really great opportunity because uh, the, the you know the gas uh, as they have uh, calculated uh, will reduce our, our costs by about fifty percent. But the issue uh, when it comes to sustainability is the total amount of emissions that would come from this project. So from an environmental standpoint. Uh, have we done just a, a let's say a, a, a big picture overall comparison between uh, taking the road of uh, and this is basically one of the alternatives is going down a road of uh, more uh, quicker and faster application of things like renewables, whether it's wind, solar, or other options as opposed to the gas to shore project, which will definitely include not only the emissions from the plants, but from all the other infrastructure, things like transportation trucks and other things that have to come into play to allow this uh, project to, you know, to come to fruition and look at, at whether or not it's a, it's a wash or are we headed in the wrong direction with respect to the sustainable strategy that that has been already, um, you know, outlined. All right, um, David. So the the Environmental Protection um, Agency, we are the guardians of the environment. Um, as as you would be aware, um, our mission's re mission requires putting measures in place for protection of human health and the environment. So. As a part of the EIA, um, all existing policies, uh, all existing applicable policies, um, strategies, and so on, would have to be um, assessed, and that forms a component of the, the EIA study. Um, so um, it's not that we are, you know, saying that some of the, the, the older strategies are, um, are the new ones we are going to actually be selective. No, the, the consultants are required to analyze um, the existing applicable policies that are relative to this, this um, project. So your, your concern or, or the question that you, you're raising, that um, aspect would be addressed in the environmental impact assessment. All right, I see Mike and Odomiko, you wanted to respond to one of the previous questions or? Yeah, actually just oh, a, general, a general comment if I could. So Mr. Modesti, um, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Uh, one of the things that uh, you know is clear when we look at some of this project uh, as the benefits for Guyana, it will reduce the Guyana's dependence on imported fuel for power generation. And as you were aware, and you did uh, make some comments as it relates to uh, natural gas power generation, it is a lower carbon intensity uh, than the current options of diesel and heavy fuel oil uh, that's used. So, you know, I know that it's kind of, we have the scope and I know there's been some conversation about where uh, the, this process is and how, but how it's supposed to be managed uh, directly as it relates to impacts for socioeconomic, physical, and uh, the environmental impacts that are related to it. Uh, but as indicated in, in the slides and uh, as appropriate, uh, once those uh, terms of scope is identified, a lot of the items that were captured by yourself and many others here will it could be part of the EIA. Uh, surely uh, air emissions is something that we're all concerned about. That's obviously why there's the work carried out uh, in Guyana, in the Western Hemisphere, in the world, to look at those specific things as it relates to cumulative impacts and individual uh, property uh, and uh, industry impacts. 
So I, I think that that should be one of those items that uh, should be clarified just to identify that the, the fuel system uh, that's looked at is at the lower carbon intensity, which lends itself to the comments that you did uh, appropriately say just a few minutes ago. So thank you for that. All right, thank you, D'Amico. So we have to um, wrap this session up. We have another scoping meeting um, tomorrow at, at Humaniana. I'll share the, the schedule for the other meetings shortly. But I think um, Simone, I'm seeing her hand, and I believe that will be the last um, submission for, for this meeting. Go ahead, Simone. Thank you, Ken Daisy. And thank you, all of you, the EPA, as well as the, the company, Mr. D'Amico's company, for spending the time with us. We appreciate it very much. Um, I just wanted to follow up on, on the last set of questions to make a closing point, which is we really can't look at our environmental impact options for example, as to alternatives where it comes to carbon emissions, if we don't have a good sense of how much of the gas coming to shore is going to supply a power plant, how much is going to be dry gas and how much is going to be um, methane, but butane, um, et cetera. So the project description, that, that's the kind of example where the project description is not enabling us to be able to actually uh, respond on an informed basis. Um, and of course, the other options for uh, energy on land are not just the dirty fuels, but renewables. And I believe um, there's a solar renewable now that's producing on a, a, a third the price of what this pipeline would come up to. So these are the kinds of things, I mean, what we want to do is to come up with the best possible option for everybody. This is not a war, but it cannot also be a walkover for Guyana. And, and as citizens, we have to consider the, the present and the future because we're bearing lots of costs here. The, the one thing that I think would really help this process is if you as a professional, Mr. D'Amico, could uh, speak to those who have um, hired your services to establish what are some basic parameters and best standards because it's it's not meeting that right now and i wish you well but we will be you know we will be following up to see how this goes forward and the point is you cannot define the purpose of this project as to build a pipeline the epa is immediately limiting any possible discussion of alternatives by doing that and none of us want to decide where you put your pipeline we want to decide what's the best way to get gas to shore and if all the gas even needs to come to shore. Maybe sometimes just putting it back in is better. Getting it on ships to other countries is better. Who knows? But if you can't have that discussion with us, then you're treating us like idiots in a charade. And we're not playing that game. That game is over. So thank you again for your time. And we really look forward to engaging you constructively and coming up with a great plan. Candace, Candace, this is my Mike Prasad. Hi, uh, Mike. Right. Hello, and uh, good Sorry, afternoon. Sorry, did I miss you? Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, listen, go ahead. I have a couple. I have a couple of questions. Informational type. Who is the head of the EPA now, now today? Do you know who is the head of the EPA? The executive director is Mr. Cameron Farson. Um, does the EPA have veto power over this gas line project? Um, I'll, add, I'll invite our legal rep to respond to you um, in that regard. Uh, do you have another question though? Yes. Um, that, uh -huh. Janet Balkan just posted a comment there. I, I hope everyone saw that comment. Um, EEPGL. EEPGL is a shell company, has no assets. Why is the government of Guyana dealing with EEPGL? Why would they want to sign a $900 million project with EEPGL? And does the parliament have anything to do with this? Should approval of this project, $900 million, come from the parliament, thank you.
All right, so I'd love our, our legal rep to respond to you, but just to indicate that the EPA is, is addressing the project on the merits of the application that was um, submitted by the developer um, and in the ambits of, within the ambits of the Environmental Protection Act that governs our operation. Um, so I'll allow our, our legal rep to um, respond to your other questions. Yes, go ahead, um, say. All right, I think he's having some, um, some technical difficulties, um, but the, the agency, as I mentioned, is um, operating within the the ambit of the Environmental Protection Act and once an application is submitted to us and it's taken through the, the screening process um, and of course the decision goes two ways, EIA required or EIA not required. Once the application would have met um, satisfactorily, met the requirements, um, the agency would proceed to, to publish um, that notice and hence this application of salvage we mentioned earlier. Um, I, I don't know if you were in with in her initial um, clarification that the after the screening process, the, the, the project was published. Um, this is an EIA required project. It has satisfactorily met the requirements of the Environmental Protection Agency. And what the Environmental Protection Agency would be focusing on is an environmental authorization and permit pending the environmental impact assessment being done um, satisfactorily. Um, also, Candace, just to add to what, what you're saying, um, I know you would have mentioned that we would be publishing the EIA for review, and I just want to um, inform all of those who are on the call that the public will have 60 days from the time the document is submitted to review and to make its written submissions to the EPA. This again is another avenue for participation, which is in accordance with our act. So this is not the end of the, of the participatory process. You also have the 60 day review period whereby you can um, look at the document and see whether your comments and concerns were addressed and also to state any other uh, any other concerns outside of what you would have raised here today um, to uh, make that submission to the EPA. Yes, so um, the EPA is the the lead regulatory body for environmental management in Guyana and is the only um, or the only agency, I should say, that um, is prescribed by the Environmental Protection Act to pronounce um, to issue sorry environmental authorization or environmental permit. All right. So um, I thank you for your really really insightful. Um, interesting um, talk, thought-provoking, profound um, comments this afternoon, um, the submissions that you have made and for your your interest and your participation in this process, um, just to indicate to you the way forward. So the comments we have received at, at this and other scoping meeting, uh, as well as written submissions, as I mentioned, um, the app requires as well will be compiled, analyzed, and these will contribute towards the development of the terms and scope for the 
EIA for the proposed gas to energy project. Again, uh, you have until July 25th, 2021 to make written submissions. Of course, we are capturing all that was said here today. Um, but if there are additional things um, that you want to submit or you prefer to formally make your submissions to the executive director, you can do so on or before July 25th. And you can send it to our, our um, physical address at our main office, that's Ganji Street, Sophia. You can also submit um, your comments to EPA, epaguyana.org. And again, I really, really want to say thank you for your, your contribution this afternoon. And I want to remind the persons um, on the, the, the platform this afternoon as well, we, we have a very active social media page and we try to post um, the relevant information as far as possible on our website as well. So um, do um, follow us and you'll be updated on what is happening with regards to not only this, um, but other developmental project um, activities and um, of the agency. So I thank you very much again for uh, your participation this afternoon. And just to leave the reminder that um, you still require, you can submit, you can make your written submissions on or before July um, 25th. Thank you for being um, constructive, you know, and candid about the discussion that we would have had and we've noted them. And of course, we will seek to, to improve our engagement as we move forward in this process. Um, thanks to everyone the, and the project team as well for their, the developer for their, their presentation. And um, we do look forward to continued engagement engagements with you. So I, if there are no further um, questions or submissions, um, please do as well to share the information with your, um, you know, the rest of your family or community. And so there are several meetings that are happening. And we're really happy that, you know, the interest is there and persons are seeing it necessary to participate. And we do hope that that will be the trend. So do share the information um, to the, for the other upcoming meetings so we can have um, maximum participation in this regard. So with that, I would just want to share the final schedule for a few and before I adjourn the meeting. So our next uh, meeting is tomorrow and, and we have um, on Monday, Diamond and Lenora West Demerara, we have another virtual meeting at a later time to capture um, those who may not have been able to make this time. And there, there are some other physical meetings. And of course, I mentioned that this um, is the scoping and detailed consultations will be conducted as a part of the EIA process. So thanks everyone and do have a pleasant rest of the afternoon. Um, for for those, sorry, go ahead. I, I just wanted to uh, thank yourself for, for moderating, this, moderating this session and uh, those that uh, took the time out this afternoon. Uh, to participate. Uh, th thank you for that. Also wanted to highlight, because uh, I, I know that's uh, key considerations as it relates to the, the EIA process, that during that 60-day period uh, that was referred to uh, by uh, Ms. Itwaru, it that there will be disclosure meetings to explain what was uh, identified in the EIA. So that is also not just the opportunity to find it on the EPA site or, or as it will be uh, advertised to make sure that everyone knows it is available for that review period. There will also be disclosure meetings, which allows a bit more time. There's a 60 days to that so we can get better coverage and uh, look to have that involvement from the stakeholders uh, and, 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 ha and receive the comments. So thank you for that. And thank you for your time this afternoon. Yes, thank you for your time. And I'm sorry if there were any questions that were missed or submissions, but we have them all um, recorded and, and we'll take note of them. So do have a pleasant rest of the day, everyone. And remember to stay safe. I will now adjourn the meeting. You. Recording stopped. <laughs>